And it's a different lesson, but we have to understand that we're not talking about someone who, you know, is saved and then they lost their salvation. What, what these verses help us to, to discern is, was this person regenerated? Has he ever been regenerated? Because if a person is regenerated, then he has God in him. But what he's indicating to us, what he's describing for us, is someone who has never been born again, who continues on. Age, you couldn't drag, you couldn't drug me up or wild horses, and uh, they did a great job. Thank you all. Well, this time the young people are going to be dismissed. I actually remember tonight, and so they're off to the races. All right, great, lovely, good group tonight.
And this is needs to on. Is it on? It's muted. It's on now, right? Track it now. Is it real now? All right. I, was, I need somebody to keep me straight all the time. And think of that. Leslie is, of course, with uh, Jennifer this week and uh, coming back tomorrow night. So I've really missed my wife. I'm learning how to cook again. It's not a pretty sight. And, uh, but anyway, <laughs> enough of my commiserations. <laughs> Amen. All right, well, let's turn then to 1 John chapter 3, please, tonight. 1 John chapter 3. And uh, we're continuing our, our study through the New Testament. Uh, we're in 1 John. After 1 John and 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and then we are in the book of the Revelation. So what are you going to do when you get finished with the Revelation? Don't know yet. <laughs> well, actually, I've never studied three Acts and uh, some of the Gospels as well. So, and then we, and actually, well, actually, we're already started again because on Sunday mornings we're doing Romans. So we're already, we're already started to go over again. So anyway, tonight's uh, passage of Scripture is a very difficult passage of Scripture. And uh, that's one good thing about expository preaching, where you preach verse by verse and passage by passage, because you're forced to teach and open up what's there, where you just don't go to the easy bits or the bits you're interested in, right? So that's a, that's a good discipline. It's good discipline for the preacher, good discipline for the congregation. And it might not be all razzle-dazzle, but if you give yourself time and patience and we get into this, you'll come away with treasure and you'll come away with understanding. And I hope that will be true tonight. So our passage tonight is 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 to verse number 10. Verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. And for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Let me read that again. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil... Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Father, we pray that you'll give us help tonight as we look into your scriptures and Holy Spirit who wrote these words down. Help us to understand, Lord, the intention of these words and how it applies to our lives. And uh, Lord, as we go through this process, teach us things about how to study the Bible and how we can uh, understand difficult passages. So give us grace, Lord, tonight and help and uh, we pray that you will help us to sense your help in this uh, teaching and preaching tonight. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of the message tonight is, Can a Christian Live in Sin? Now, that's a very important question, very intriguing question. And there's different answers to that question. And uh, before we get finished with the message tonight, we're going to try and answer that question. But the question is asked because of verse number nine. Look at verse number nine again. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now some people use verse nine, and also verse six, where it says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, and whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And some people have said, well, because of these verses, we believe that uh, that believers, true Christians, are sinlessly perfect. They call that sinless perfection. And usually it's linked to a work of grace, the second blessing, uh, that after a person saved, where they receive the Holy Spirit, and at that point the sinful nature is eradicated, and they basically believe, I don't know how they believe it, but they believe that they don't sin anymore. I, I personally met a man who told me he hadn't sinned in 28 years. I kind of looked over at his wife. <laughs> I did. I looked over at his wife. Because there's something when I, you know, if, if you were to say, no, Christians don't sin, there's something that just doesn't sound right about that. Now, this is a difficult passage, as I've said, and why do you think it is a difficult passage? If I told you this is a difficult passage, which it is, 
Why is it a difficult passage? Here's why it's a difficult passage. Number one, it contradicts what we know to be true from experience. Okay? If you're a Christian, I mean, if I was to say, if you're a Christian in here and you don't sin, could I, would you put your hand up? You know, I don't think we'll get very many hands up because all of us know the reality that within us still there is a sin nature still there. And so it goes against what my own personal experience is about myself. It also goes against my experience with other people. You know, we live in a community, we see Christian people. Uh, and unfortunately, they've taken statistics. I think Barna took statistics that when it comes to things about morality and like marriage and divorce and stuff, there's, there's virtually no difference between people who profess to be saved and people who are not Christians. Now, that's a bad, that's a bad thing. It really, really is. There should be a marked difference. Of course, they may be broadened out to all kinds of everybody who names the name of Christ. But not only does this contradict this idea that Christians don't sin anymore, and of course, we're going to ask, you know, is that what this is teaching? I'm hopefully going to answer tonight. But not only does that, that, that notion that Christians do not sin, not only does it contradict my experience, but more importantly than my experience, is it contradicts what the Bible says. I mean, very clearly. I mean, we could name the people who have sinned. Um, you know, Jeremy did a good job of that on Wednesday night. David, you tell me that David wasn't, wasn't a believer, wasn't a saved person. Uh, anyway, look at First John chapter 1, because obviously, here in our context, John has already said something similar to that. In chapter 1, verse number 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So how can you reconcile that verse that says that believers sin and we have a responsibility to confess our sins and get our sins right with God as believers? It goes on in chapter 2, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Well, why would he have to do that if Christians don't sin? And he says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate, a defense attorney, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So not only does it contradict my experience and what I see to be real and know to be true, but it also, more importantly, contradicts what the Bible already says right in the same book. So that's why it's a difficult passage. When the one scripture seems to contradict another scripture, um, there has to be a proper understanding of that because the Bible does not contradict itself, okay? It just doesn't. And so when I come to the Bible and I see that contradiction there, seemingly it's a contradiction, that's what makes it a difficult passage because you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper where you can see that there is no contradiction, okay? Now, when we are facing a difficult passage, and part of the sermon tonight is not just about answering this question, <laughs> But also to help you to understand how do you face difficult passages, not this one, but maybe other difficult passages. Um, how, do you, how do you go about, do you have to go to a commentary, do you have to go to a preacher? What about you? Remember we talked about the unction of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit. He is really our main teacher. How can you approach a difficult passage and really try to come to a, a proper understanding of that passage? That's something that all of us, not just the preacher, but all of us should do. So when we interpret the Bible, and by the way, good teaching of the Bible really should stem out of a good interpretation of the Bible. Okay? And the, to interpret the Bible, what we're actually what we want here is we want what the author meant to the readers originally. Okay? So when John wrote this book to people, and he wrote it from Ephesus, we believe, and so basically modern day Turkey, the churches like um, of, of Asia Minor, the seven churches of uh, Ephesus and uh, Laodicea and all those churches. Uh, would have gotten this 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 letter, and so how did the people who read this letter understand? How did they understand it? Okay, so there are two tools. Well, there's many tools, but there's two primary tools that you have and I have to help us to interpret the Bible. We believe, and I've been taught uh, in the now listen to this: the historical grammatical method of interpretation. So there's two words. And to help, or two tools to help us to interpret the Bible so that we understand it as it was originally given. Historical and grammatical. So historical 
means that the Bible was written, you know, it was written 2,000 years ago, the New Testament, the Old Testament before that. And so it, it's, it's a literal book that happened in time, and it's entrenched in history and geography. It literally was written to a particular people at a particular time and a particular place. And some things were going on historically around those people that this was written to. And so when we think about the historical understanding of Scripture, we could ask questions like, well, who's he writing to? Is he writing to Gentiles? Is he writing, writing to Jewish people? And so that would help us to understand what's going on when we understand who is he writing to. Uh, we could ask the question, when is he writing? Um, is there something going on? Like, for, for example, we, uh, when we were in First Peter, something was happening. When did he write? During the time of persecution that was coming from Nero, that was coming out. It was writing in Rome, and it was coming to the rest of the churches that Peter was writing to. And so that's why he was talking about persecutions and suffering and all of that, because in its historical context, it meant that there was things going on. So who did he write it to? When did he write it? And where did he write it to? And so one of the wonderful things we have in our Bible um, that we do have is a thing called maps. Because not only is the Bible historical, because it's historical, it's also geographical. In other words, it was written to a literal people back in history at a particular place. And the wonderful thing about the Bible is, and especially the age in which we live, because you can Google all kinds of maps and charts, and you can see where this was written to, who it was written to. And when we study the Bible, geography, and it also fits into archaeology, because they can actually go to those places. You can go to those places today. You can get on a plane, you can go to Jerusalem. You can go to the foundation that was built by Herod the Great, the temple that Jesus uh, went into. Those steps are still there. Three steps of land and three steps of land. You can actually go see the stones that Peter preached from, that Jesus preached from. It's an amazing thing, archaeology, because it's geography. For example, uh, the Bible in the New Testament tells us that Jesus fed the 5,000. And then it also has another story with, where he fed the 4,000. Okay, those were two different people. Did you know that? The 5,000 that he fed were the Jewish people. The 4,000 that he fed were Gentile people. How do you know that? Because it tells you that he went to Decapolis. He went to the land of the Gergesenes. You know, the... Um, the uh, demonic of the, of the Gadarenes, that was on the eastern shore of Galilee. When he fed the Jewish people, it was above Bethsaida and Capernaum, which is just north of Galilee. But when he fed the Gentiles, he's over into the Capolis, he's over into the Gentile area, uh, east of Galilee. And it was, a different, it was a different people all together, which is kind of good because God was not just interested in the Jewish people, he was also interested in the Gentile people. And uh, you remember the woman whose daughter was sick and, and Jesus left Capernaum, off on a rabbit trail now, he left Capernaum went all the way to Tyre. And the, and, and the woman came to him and said, Lord, my daughter is sick, can you heal her? And he says, I can't give the, the, the children's bread to dogs. And she said, but yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. What a wonderful answer. And really it was a test. Jesus was testing her and she responded by faith and humility and he turned around and healed her daughter. And then they went back. You know what that means? He knew that she had a need and he left to go all the way to her to meet that need and then come home again. But she was a Gentile. God is interested in the Gentiles also. And so when we think about the historical interpretation of scripture you have to seek scripture in its historical context you got to know who's talking to and when it happened and where it happened and all the details surrounding that and that will give you clue, clues to what's going on because if you don't know that there's things in here that you you won't understand now i don't want to start getting off and, and give you examples because i will be off on rabbit trails and i don't want to don't have time for it so the second the first thing is historical the second thing is grammatical. We believe in the historical grammatical interpretation of Scripture. Now, grammatical is grammar, which means words. So another tool that we have is the actual words that are used. What were the actual words? Now, now I believe in the King James Version of the Bible. Okay, this is the, God, God preserves his words. Okay, And the King James Version of the Bible is the word of God. Okay. Don't ever doubt that I, I believe that. I, I don't think you do. 
But, there are, but the Bible was not written in English. It was written in Greek. And of course, the important thing about the King James Version is the underlying taxes receptus, the, the uh, received tax, the majority tax. Uh, we, there's over 2,000 New Testament manuscripts that back up the Bible you've got in your hand. And the new versions come from, the changes that they've made in the new versions come from what they say are older, older copies. And they may be older, but they're incomplete. And so the whole, the whole last part of chapter uh, 16 of Mark is gone. And you have the equivalent of 1 Peter, the verses that are in 1 Peter, five chapters of 1 Peter, the equivalent amount of verses that are taken out because those older versions didn't have them. And they think they're, because they're older, they're closer to the source, so therefore they're more reliable. I disagree. They're, they're, they're older because nobody was using them. And the majority text, the majority of, of all those manuscripts um, they were copied and copied and copied and copied, and they all said the same thing, underlying your Bible. The, the reason there's so many of them is because that's the Bible the church used. But the point is that the, the Bible was written in Greek. And so the Greek, I mean, you may have three Greek words for one English word. Do you think it's worth it to look at those words and see if there's any shades of meanings? Um, I think it is. And so from that, from the words itself, and we're going to see this tonight, but from the words itself, it helps us to interpret what the Holy Spirit intended when he wrote these words down. So, historical and grammatical, those are tools that you can use when you're trying to understand what the Bible's saying. So, the first thing we're going to, we're going to look at two things tonight. One is the interpretation of this passage. And then secondly, the application of this passage. So, and we're going to use those tools tonight, as you'll see as we get into it. So, the interpretation. Okay, so what is the historical background? We're going to use the historical method of interpretation. What is the historical background to First John? Well, we've already mentioned this before, and this is a well-known and document, documented fact, that there's a group called the Gnostics that were in the time of John. John is writing toward the end of the first century. And, uh, but really, the Gnostics actually didn't, it didn't stop the Gnostics. The Gnostics actually uh, got bigger and more influential in the second century. And, and it's interesting that those two uh, manuscripts I talked about, um, uh, one of them is the Alexandrian text in Alexandria, Egypt, the monastery in Alexandria, Egypt. And guess where the Gnostic center was in Alexandria, Egypt? So it may be very, uh, that a lot of the falsehood came over, was written, it was influenced, the text of Scripture, the New Testament, was influenced by the Gnostics. And that's why, and by the way, that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses would use the New Word Translation, not, not, not interpreted from the Textus Receptus, but from uh, Vaticanus and Ale the, the Alexandrian text. Because the Alexandrian text is very, very weak on the deity of Christ, Okay where we would say God was manifest in the flesh, I think it's first, first Timothy 3, 16, where God was manifested in the flesh, they would say he was manifested in the flesh. Well, there's a big difference between he was manifested in the flesh and God was manifested in the flesh, you see. Anyway, so words are important. And we'll see that as our next one. But the first thing is, what is the historical background? And that is the Gnostics were there. Well, what did the Gnostics believe? Okay, now remember... They believe that matter was evil. Now, why would they think that? Well, everything that happens physically where things get destroyed, that's a physical world. A tornado comes through here. It's a physical thing that's going to destroy physical things. Uh, when you get hurt in your body, that's a physical thing. Uh, where pain and suffering happens, where does that happen? In the physical realm. And so they, they got this idea that everything that, was, that is matter is wrong, it's evil. And what they believed was that the true God could not have made this earth. Because the true God is transcendent and he is all holy, all pure. He could never make something that has dirt or, or pain or suffering. Of course, we understand that that happens because of the fall. But they got this in their mind that the true God could not make this. And so what the true God made was lesser gods. He made all these gods. They were called eons. And they had a whole hierarchy of angels, or, uh, well, eons, or these demigods, uh, divine beings that were not true God, but they were creations of the true God. And then one of those uh, demigods, one of those creations of the true God, and many times they were called angels, that's why we'll get to in just a minute, where Colossians talks about worshipping angels, that's the eons, that's these lesser gods. And so who do you think they thought Jesus was? 
one of these eons. That Jesus is a lesser God. And, the, so, and just like Jehovah's Witnesses, it's the exact same thing as Jehovah's Witnesses believe. That Jesus is not the true God or very God. Uh, he is the first created being. So God the Father, uh, or God Jehovah, made Jesus Christ the first created being. And Jesus makes everything else. Um, so what we're saying is that they believe that matter was evil. They believe that the flesh is evil. So therefore there's no way that God become incarnate. And that's when in the Gospel of John he says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. They would completely deny that. They would deny the incarnation because they're taking their philosophy and laying it over Scripture. And their philosophy supersedes Scripture. And their philosophy is, God's up here, evil's down here. You can't have a holy God in an evil fleshly body. But the truth is, that's what happened. And Jesus is not a lesser God. He is, there is only one God. There is none else beside him, the Old Testament says. And Jesus is Jehovah, and he is the creator. But these things they denied. Now, I just set that up to say this. What about the Christian's flesh? The Christian's flesh, he's, we're, we're in flesh. Is that on? Yeah. So we're in flesh, so the Christian flesh is evil. Therefore, now there, here's where it splits up. There's two ways the Gnostics dealt with their flesh, with the whole idea of flesh and sin. One was, one idea was the flesh was be, to be denied. And that was called asceticism. Now I want you to take your Bible and look over Colossians. Because guess what? The book of Colossians is always is also teaching against the, the falsehoods of Gnosticism. For example, you go up to Colossians 1 verse 16, where Paul says, For by him, that is by Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him, and this is the clincher, and for him. Uh, if you come down to chapter 2 and verse number 8, he says, Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, these false teachers, these philosophers, these Gnostics, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him that is in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That would be completely against Gnosticism. And then if you look um, at verse 18, Here's what it says, let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshipping of angels. Are we supposed to worship angels? Well, you see, if they're demigods, then that would justify them worshipping these, these many gods. But of course, we know that's false. By the way, you should never worship an angel. You should never pray to an angel. You should never worship Mary. You should never pray to Mary. You should never worship a saint and pray to a saint. There's only one that is worthy of our worship. When Satan wanted Jesus to bow down and worship, he says, he says, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. There's only one to be worshipped, only one to be prayed to, only one to be bowed down to. And so they're not to worship the angels. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having uh, nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. In other words, giving Christ his proper place. But I want you to notice verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Now what this was all about uh, is, is that these Gnostics, some of them believed in denying the flesh. And asceticism were, is where they would have a strict diet. They would not eat a whole lot at all, and they, would, they wouldn't be able to eat anything rich, probably, not a, a, probably like a plant uh, diet, no meat whatsoever, maybe not even fish. Um, it would be a very, very strict diet. They would be involved with very physical hardships, putting their body through some physical, punishing their body. And then part of that would be celibacy, that they would not only uh, refrain from marrying, but they would forbid anybody else from marrying. Uh, if you look down, uh, look over at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Do you remember in uh, 1 Timothy 6, sorry, chapter 5 verse 23, where Paul says, drink, uh, a little, uh, drink, no, uh, drink no more water, but take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Paul was uh, 
I think hinting that Timothy was being, brought in, being drawn into this asceticism thing. And, and he's not talking about alcoholic wine, by the way. He's talking about um, if you drink the water over there, you're going to have stomach problems. So uh, they were to, to mix. Um, even if the wine was alcoholic, it was diluted so far. It wouldn't get you drunk, but it was enough to kill the bugs in the water. And Paul says, you know, and, well, why is Timothy not doing that, you know? Um, he's he's uh, restricting his dad in many ways. And so Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 5. Now the Spirit sp speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This is false teaching now. And it was, it was true with Paul, it was true with Peter, true with uh, John. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now watch verse 3. Forbidding to marry. And it could be that Roman Catholicism picked some of this up as well with their priest. You know, a priest is supposed to be celibate. Why? Peter had a wife. He had a mother-in-law. Be a fool to have a mother-in-law and have a wife, right? <laughs> he had a wife. And Paul says we have the we have authority to, to lead about a sister or a wife as as as, as uh, a Cephas and other of the apostles. They all had wives. Um, well, Peter, Paul didn't have. He probably had a wife, and then she possibly died because I think in order to be a Pharisee. Um, that you had to be married to be a leader in, with the Pharisees. But anyway, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and not to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. They're saying, you're not to marry, you're not to eat meat, you're not to do this, that and the other thing. That, all, that is all Gnosticism. That is those who are involved with asceticism and denying the flesh because the flesh is evil. We're at war with the flesh. You can't do anything in the flesh. You know, God has given us many wonderful gifts in the flesh. In fact, the Bible says God has given us all things uh, to enjoy. Thank God for his blessings. You know, it's good to eat. You know, Jesus ate. I'll tell you what, he ate meat. He ate the Passover lamb. He ate fish. He ate eggs. Um, God has given us those things to, to eat. There's nothing wrong with eating as long as it's in its proper context and you're not being greedy or you're not being a glutton. It's a good thing to eat, you have to eat or you're going to die. And it's good to be healthy in your eating. Um, sex is not, uh, is not a sin, do you understand that? In its proper context, that's a blessing of God. Marriage has been designed not just for procreation, but for um, mutual en enjoyment and blessing. And uh, it's not dirty at all in its proper context. But they're saying, no, it's the flesh. It's got to be dirty. We've got to stay away from it so nobody gets married. Well, that's going to be a disaster. Um, look over chapter 6 there in the last verses, verse 20 to 21. Uh, I'm sorry, that would be, hold on a second here, yeah. Um, in verse 20 it says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now, of course, we use that in our day with the false sense that is around with evolution and all that. But you know the word sense is there? Gnosis, where we get Gnostic from. It means knowledge. It's false knowledge. It's oppositions of knowledge, falsely so-called, because it's not really knowledge when it opposes the true knowledge of God. Verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now, what I'm simply saying is this, is that Gnosticism... This is a historical truth that you have to understand when you're interpreting the Bible. And Gnosticism uh, felt that the flesh was evil. And the first way they dealt with it was they denied it. They denied the flesh. They were ascetics. They were like, you know, monks locking them out, themselves away. Not marrying, not eating, not, all kind, you know, hard, hard labor. Trying to deny the flesh. The second way they did it, this is weird, but this is the way people work. The second way they dealt with the flesh was they didn't, there's another group that they didn't deny the flesh, they indulged the flesh. And so they were known as libertines or antinomianism, which is anti means against, and nomianism means law. So they were against all kinds of law, all kinds of rules, all kinds of restrictions whatsoever. They threw it all off. There was a guy called a Carp a Carpertes, and uh, the group that followed him uh, took on that title. You can look this up. Uh, online, and they were in opposition to the ascetics, and they were indulgent, they were licentious, they had uh, liberties that they didn't want any control, any restrictions whatsoever on anything concerning the flesh. So you can imagine what that was like. 
And so drunkenness and gluttony, um, they actually said that part of their teaching was, and they had groups of these Gnostics, and they had teachings that, uh, of common ownership. So um, my car is not my car, it's our car. So if you want to, you know, to use it, go ahead. Now, you know, there is a, a mutual care that we're to have one for another. Um, and really everything that we have belongs to God. But he has, he, God uh, teaches ownership, okay? He always keeps the link between effort and reward. If you work for it, it's yours. Amen. You don't have to share it with anybody unless you want to, okay? That's the whole principle of almsgiving. You have it and you're willing to give it. That's up to you, but nobody's forcing you to do it. But see, they were different. They thought, what's yours is mine. What's mine is mine. What's, what's yours is mine. No, it was a common ownership. So they, and it was like a commune type thing. Now listen, this, ring, this rings bells for me of the different cults that have been around in the last hundred years. But not only is our things common to all, our bodies are common to all. So my wife is not just my wife, she's your wife. Now that ended up in all kinds of gross, serious immorality and sin. And they were going, not stated, they had no restraints whatsoever. They had no laws whatsoever. They had no rules whatsoever. Anything went. You can imagine what that was like. Now that was the teaching of part of this group called the Gnostics. And so both taught in some fashion a, a sort of enlightenment. You know, when you talk about Hinduism and Buddhism especially, and even Islam, because Islam has God way up there, you know, even in, the, in, in paradise, and they don't talk, they talk about the 70 virgins, but God is not in their paradise. You know that with Islam? You don't have the connection with, with, uh, with Allah, the way the Bible teaches the relationship we have with God. What's the best thing about heaven for us? That where I am, there you may be also. Yeah, yeah. God is the most important thing about heaven, but not with Islam. And the thing about, um, and the point I'm making here is this, this sort of enlightenment, when you study Buddhism, is they try to separate the spirit from the body, the immaterial from the material. So you'll see these monks and they're doing this lotus position and they're having this meditation or whatever. And they're trying to be one with the universe, but separate from the body. And so this is all part of a, like an enlightenment or a spirit that is separated from the material world. You see what I'm saying? Because the material world is evil, so we want to separate from that. And that's why on Mars Hill, when Paul talked about the resurrection, that's when they said, oh, we'll, we'll hear of you again. He's off a rocker now because they were all about getting away from the flesh, getting away from the physical. And he's talking about coming back into the physical. Resurrection is where your spirit comes back into your body. And they're saying, we're not, we're not going to go with that. Because that was the teachings of the times. Christianity was completely different. So as we study 1 John, what we need to understand is that John is speaking about the people of group two. Those Gnostics that threw off every rule and restriction, and these were the licentious libertines who had no law. They were called uh, uh, Carpocrates uh, and uh, following Carpocrates. Uh, can't say that stuff, but anyway. And so he was dealing with people who said that they knew God, but they were absolutely lawless, had no rules whatsoever. And they were completely given over to unrestrained sin. Now, if you go back to 1 John, and we're going to come to the words here in just a moment. But if you look at 1 John 3 and look at verse number 2, he says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And what he's basically saying there is that, that sin and whosoever transgresseth of the law is basically lawless. That's the actual word that's used. That, uh, that the transgression of the law or the lawlessness of those who um, commit sin and, and who are transgressing the law. So he's dealing with the second group. And this second group are basically, uh, you know, how would you describe them? They were involved with debauchery. Okay, so that's historical. Second tool we've got is grammatical. The words... First of all, I want you to notice the context of the words. When you're studying the Bible, context is everything. That is, the context is the words right around the verse, right in that chapter, right in the rest of that book. That's what you call context. 
And you can't take something, uh, you can't, you know, if I'm having a conversation with you and I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm going along, you know, joining the dots, and you can't say something, I'm not going to in that conversation completely turn away and talk about something completely different and then come back to what I'm talking about. In the conversation, it's going to be consist consistent all the way through, and there's different topics and so on, but it's basically in the same context. <laughs> So when you're reading the Bible and, it's, and it's, it's got a context of things and it's saying it's, it's teaching a certain thing, you can't just take one verse and rip it out and make it say what you think it says, contradicting the context in which it's found. Context is really important. Well, what's the context here? Well, in chapter 1, he what does he contrast in chapter 1? We've already taught this. Don't disappoint me, class. He contrasts in chapter 1 something with something. Do you remember what it is? God is in the, and men are in the what? Okay, this is where I get, this is where I, I've got to find out if I taught well enough. So he contrasts those who are fellowshipping with God. Now God is, God is light. Thank you, brother mate. And we're the, we're, men loved darkness. darkness rather than light. So he contrasts light and darkness. You cannot say I'm walking with God and I'm over here in the darkness because God's not in the darkness. God's in the light. So how can you be with God if you're over here and God's over there? He's contrasting light and darkness. In chapter 2, uh, we talked about the wheat and the chaff. Do you remember that? Talking about what we have as believers and then the world. What is the world offering you? That's, the world is, is chaff. It's rubbish compared to the treasure that we already have. So why would you go after the world when the world can't give you peace and joy and satisfaction and contentment and eternal life and all those things? So he's contrasting Things that are treasure against things that are trash, the chaff to the wheat. And also in chapter 2, uh, from verse 18, he talks about uh, the deceivers. He talks about lies, those who are telling lies and those who are telling truth. So in the next section, he contrasts truth with lies. And he talks about, for example, uh, in verse 26 of chapter 2, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. There is false teachers. There's people who are true and people who are liars. He's contrasting light, darkness, chaff, wheat, truth, lies. And now he's contrasting. And he began it actually at the, at the end of verse 29 where he talks about everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him, born of God. Behold what manner of the love of the, the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So now he's going to contrast the sons of God against the sons of Satan or the devil. Where do you get that? It's right here. Uh, well, you can look at verse 10. He concludes that with verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Who, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth his brother. So again, he's contrasting two big groups here. Uh, in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 1, 2, 3, he's talking about us, you know, about the rapture and the reason we're going to be with God when Jesus comes for us and we're going to see him like he is, we're going to be like him. Is because we belong to him. We belong in his house. We're in his family. But not everybody that says they're a Christian are actually in the family of God. There's many people who profess to be saved, but are not possessing of salvation. And so the context here is he's contrasting people who are saved with people who are not saved in, in the broader context. So John wants them to identify the false way against the true way. False professors and true possessors. Okay? Um, and in verse 7 he says, Little children, let no man deceive you. Now Jesus said something similar to this. If you go back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And it's important that we understand there is right, there is wrong, there is truth, and there is lies. There is false prophets and true prophets. There is a true way and a false way. Why does God want you to know that? Because he doesn't want you to be seduced. He doesn't want you to be deceived. He doesn't want you to be led astray. And let me tell you, it's a jungle out there. It's an absolute jungle. There is anything and everything concerning falsehood. And you have to be discerning. And God wants you to be able to spot the wolf. And the wolf might be dressed as a sheep. But there's things that you can see. There's telltale marks that you'll look at and you say, wait, whoa, whoa, that's not a sheep, that's a wolf. That's why when people come to the church here and they're considering joining the church, and I tell them, take your time. Because they need to know what they're getting into, right? 
And what they're getting into should be something good. I hope it's good. But you know what? It also helps me to look at them. Because if I see somebody come in here and I, I'm smelling a wolf, I'm going to be going after them. And uh, if I see it soon enough, they won't join this church. And we've done that before. He said, can you really do that? Yeah. That's what a pastor, you know what the word pastor means? Shepherd. You know what? The shepherds have a relationship with sheep. Do you know their relationship to wolves is not really good? <laughs> they have a staff and a rod. And the staff is to comfort the sheep and to rescue the sheep. But the other stick, the rod, that's to beat the wolves with. And so if you want to open the church up to anything and everything, you're going to have a mess. And you have to evaluate. We have to know. Now, it's not going to be perfect, but you should at least try to vet who you're around. And as a Christian, you should do the same thing. The people you allow into your lives, don't be inviting wolves into your lives. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get bit. And Jesus told us that. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 15. He says, beware. Now, beware, that's a warning. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wounds. So they're trying to cover up really what they are. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither uh, can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is thrown down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now we all know that little phrase. By their fruits ye shall know them. It doesn't matter what they look like. A lot of times you've got to be careful even with what they're saying. Because people use words and they mean something to them but different something to you. You've got to be very discerning. But the, the telltale tell, the sign is their fruits. Look at their lines. Look at their history. And look at the fruit of their lines. And so John wants them to identify who the false, the false people are. And he's been doing it really through the whole book. But let's go back then uh, to uh, John chapter number 3. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm setting a lot of context here, but I think it's necessary for me to do that before we actually get into the words here. Now the question is, is John saying that true Christians do not sin? Because some people will take verse 6, uh, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So in other words, what people will say, if you sin, then you're not saved. You don't know him, you've, not, you've never met him. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God, if you're born again, you do not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. He's, they say if you're born again, you can't sin. It's impossible for you to sin. Doth not commit sin. Now again, when you read those verses, you're thinking, wait a minute, that's, that's kind of hard to understand. Because again, it contradicts my own what I experienced to be true. And more importantly, it contradicts these other scriptures. So words now are going to be important. Okay, So we've got the context he's dealing with, the Gnostics. Now he's going to be dealing with, we're going to look at the words. Okay, Now, in verse 4, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 10, verse 4 it says, Committeth, verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Verse 7, Let no man deceive you, he that doeth, Righteousness is righteous. So there's the word commit. Now these, these words, committeth, doeth, commit, doeth, are all the same Greek word. It's all the same word. Okay. In verse 9, uh, doth not commit sin. Verse 10, whosoever doeth not righteousness. Now the important thing about this word is this. It's all the same word and it's all got the same idea. Now I'm not trying to dazzle you with Greek because I'm not really a Greek scholar. But I have books, and I do understand some of it, okay? And the, each, each of these words is what they call linear, present, active, indicative. Indicative means it's describing what's going on. Linear is opposed to punctiliar. Linear means it keeps on going on. Present means it's keeping on going in the present, and it's active. It's actively, presently going on. And so what these words Basically, like for example, verse 9, uh, where, where it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. 
That word commit is this linear, present, active, indicative, which means, it means this, he does not keep on sinning. The idea is keep on sinning, not punctilier where you sin, but that there is a habit, a lifestyle of sin. That when a person looks at you, when they think of your name, what they think of is sin, because sin marks your life. You continue in sin. It is a lifestyle of lawlessness. And that's what he's speaking about here. So he's not speaking that a Christian cannot sin. Because we know, and he's just told us, that if we say that we have not sinned, that we land do not the truth. When it says he cannot sin, it means he cannot go on sinning. Why? Because he has been born of God. Now what does it mean to be born of God? That's where you get the word regenerated. It's the same thing. It means new life. When you're born, you get life. When you're regenerated, you're born again, which means you have new life. And it is the life of God. You have been regenerated. And that is the, the person of the, of the Godhead who is the operative of that is the, is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible also describes that, that that act of regeneration by the Holy Spirit who comes and lives inside of you also brings into your heart and life your new nature, which is called the new man that is now present in your life. And so what he's saying is someone who has been regenerated, who has the Holy Spirit of God, who, is a new, who has a new man inside of him, it is impossible for that one to keep on in a licentious lifestyle that it just, it's an, he's just basically described as one who sins constantly without laws, without rules, without any kind of restrictions whatsoever. Now I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5. Now we're going to come to the application before we close, but look at Galatians chapter 5. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. And here in Galatians, which is actually a book about how to be saved, that you're saved by grace, you're not saved by the works of the law. But there is another law in us. It's not the Ten Commandments or the law of Moses, but there, it's the law of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Is, it is the law of God inside of us and the new man that we have inside of us. In Galatians 5, well, look at verse 16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, I would think if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, that would be sin, right? So he's telling Christians, here's how not to sin. Well, that means it's possible for Christians to sin. So it cannot contradict. John is not contradicting what Galatians is telling us many other places. It is possible for a Christian to sin. But is it possible for a Christian to sin and sin and sin and sin with no remorse, no restriction, um, no, uh, and we'll get into this in detail in just a moment, but because that's what John's saying, he's referring to the Gnostics who were basically debauchery and all kinds of license to sin and licentiousness and going without any kind of restraint whatsoever. Does it, would that mark a Christian? And the answer is no way. Because Now, what I want you to see in verse 16 and 17, Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For Now watch verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, there's a lot, and he goes on talking about the, the works of the flesh and so on. I simply want to say this to you. Before you get saved, you just have the flesh. You don't have the Spirit. You have the old man. You don't have a new man. Well, before I was saved, there was no wrestling now some you know people have consciences and there's consequences i don't want to do it because i'm going to get found out or i'm going to get in trouble with the law and so there's consequences for wrongdoing people know that even without the holy spirit but before i got saved i would have enjoyed sin i would have looked forward to sin i would have boasted about sin it didn't bother me one bit i thought i was a, a grown up because i was involved in all of these things and so there was there was nothing inside of me that was checking me but when I got saved, something happened to me. I got a new life. The Holy Spirit came into me and I had a new thing called a new man. And I'll be honest with you. I had already made a decision two months after uh, I got saved to go to Bible school. And you know when you make a decision like that, when you're trying to do anything for God, Satan will be there. They oppose it. And it wasn't a situation that I designed or tried to get into, but there was one, and I, won't, I can't tell you what the details was, but I was in a situation where there was a temptation right before me, and it would have been something that would have been in my past, and here it was now as a Christian. 
And I had already made a command, I'm going to Bible school. And here this temptation was before me. And in that moment, and I recognized it. I said, Tom, if you go that way, you're not going to Bible school. It's over. And so I had a choice. And I remember making that choice that night to say no to the temptation and to go to God. Amen. Now, before I got saved, there wouldn't, have been a, there, there wouldn't have been a decision. I'd been away. But there was something now different in my life that was challenging me. Now, what, verse 17 is really important. He says, for the flesh lost. Now, the word lost the third means that he's envious, that he's, he's jealous, he's, he desires. The word lust means desire. So the flesh desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So now there's two entities working inside of me. Again, light and darkness. Okay? So in the light, the Holy Spirit is there. And he wants me and he's wooing me and he's, con he's coaxing me to go in the way of God. And he's teaching me and he's helping me and he's comforting me. And God uh, wants me to be filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm going in this direction. But my flesh is still there. Right. And here I am over in the light going in the right way. And all of a sudden I, hear, I feel something tapping on my shoulder. And I look behind me it's the flesh. Go away. Won't go away. Thank God one day he will go away forever. But not right now. He's there. And so if I'm uh, living in the spirit, trying to do the things of God, trying to do the right thing, the flesh is still there pulling me. There's still going to be some sort of temptation and the flesh knows how to do it. He knows how to push your buttons. He knows where you're weak. And the flesh, this old man is trying to pull you back. And you'll always have that fight, always, until Christ comes for us or you die. You'll always have. There's not a Christian in the world who can be saved 50 years, 60 years, best preacher, best teacher in the whole world, best Christian in the whole world, he still has the flesh every day, tap on his shoulder, come here. Now here's the other thing. If a Christian is involved in giving into the flesh, and the flesh has got him, and here he is, he's over in the darkness now. And that's what he said in chapter 1. You say you're with God, but you're over in the darkness. That's not right. John's calling the spade a spade. So the flesh has got you over here, and you're in the flesh. And you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And he lists it there for you in the rest of that chapter. Why does he give it to Christians? Why does he describe this to Christians if it's not an issue for Christians? It is an issue for Christians. Christians can be in the flesh. But here's what happens. He's over in the flesh, indulging in the things of the flesh, uh, giving in the temptation, and all of a sudden he feels a tap on the shoulder. He looks around, it's the Holy Spirit of God, it's the new man. And the new man says, come on. The Spirit of God is saying, come on. Come on this way. And you've got that tension. So, now before a person see it, he does, that fight's not there. But the scriptures make clear that a Christian has that fight going on. And if you're over here, you can't be left alone. If you're over here, you can't be left alone. If you're in the spirit, the flesh is still after you. If you're in the flesh, the Holy Spirit is still after you. Now, what I believe is taking place here, the Gnostics were not saved. And we'll get to that in the, I got hurry, in the application here. The Gnostics are not saved. They don't have anybody tapping on their shoulder over here. They're lawless. They're spiritless. They don't have regeneration. They don't have the new man. They are continuing in sin. Not just falling. Not just the odd sin. Not just um, yielding to temptation on occasion. But these people, their whole life was sin, 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 sin. Continuing in sin. Continuing in sin. And the Holy Spirit wasn't there knocking on their shoulder. I think that's who he's describing. So lastly, let us consider the application. Okay, so what I've just told you is what I believe is the proper interpretation. Although we haven't got right into all the, all the words of these verses, I believe that's the proper context, the people who he's speaking to, the time, and what's going on. And he's not saying that if a Christian, or that a Christian cannot sin, because we know he just said that we, we do sin. But what he is saying, somebody purports these Gnostics were the elite. We have the knowledge. Uh, we have the secret knowledge. We're with God. You don't really understand God. And they're involved in all these wicked, wicked sins. And he says, just mark it down. They don't know God. They're not born of God. Um, uh, because somebody's born again. They can't, a, a born again person can't do that. And so as we consider the interpretation which involves Gnostic heretics and their teaching, which was libertine and licentious and lawless lifestyle. And the question then asks, if you ask me that question about those Gnostics, which I think is what he's talking about here, are they children of God? And I would say, absolutely not. They're not children of God. 
are those who follow their teachings and practicing this lawless, this constant lawlessness, continuing and continuing in sin. Are they of God? And I would say emphatically, no, they're not of God. But now let's come back to our question. Can a, can a Christian live in sin? The answer is no. Now, someone who is genuinely born again of the Spirit of God, has the new man, has the Holy Spirit, cannot live this constant lawless, constant sinning. Number one, he will be influenced by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will not only tap on his shoulder, the Holy Spirit will be smacking him about the head. The Holy Spirit knows how to get your attention. And I'll tell you, the saddest and most miserable Christ person in the world is a Christian who's out of the will of God. Right. Now, a lost person will be happy slapping around in the dirt. But a Christian, he can never be happy. Because he has the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will also convict him of his sin. It will bring conviction. It will bring, he will bring chastening. God, read uh, Hebrews chapter 10. God will spank his children, even to the point of death. Because he says there is a sin unto death. I don't say that you should pray for that. There is a point in the Christian, and that's Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 11, when they were completely uh, blaspheming and dis disregarding the reverency of the, of the Lord's Supper. He says, for this cause many are, are weak among you, and some sleep. And so there is a point where a Christian can go where God just takes him out. But that's actually, here's the thing, if you are getting chastening and you are... Uh, getting conviction from the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is knocking on your shoulder while you're over here touching on these things, that's a good thing because it means you're saved. Amen. If you're over here and he's not talking to you and he's not convicting and you're happy enough, you might be concerned about the consequences or whatever, but you're following after sin. It's a lifestyle of sin, a habitual sinning all the time. And the Holy Spirit's not there. You're lost. And that's who I think he's speaking about here. And so someone who continues in lawlessness and a lifestyle devoid of God and God's influence, it simply indicates that he was never saved. And it's a different lesson, but we have to understand that we're not talking about someone who, you know, is saved and then they lost their salvation. What, what these verses help us to, to discern is, was this person regenerated? Has he ever been regenerated? Because if a person is regenerated, then he has God in him. But what he's indicating to us, what he's describing for us, is someone who has never been born again, who continues on in this lifestyle. And so I want to just end by saying this. There are many professors who are not possessors. Now, I know people from home watch this, so I've got to be careful who, what names I use. But when I got saved, I was really zealous about getting other people saved, as you should be, right? right. And so I witnessed to everybody. And there was a young man who was very close to him, only giving him his name. And uh, I witnessed to him. There was a tent revival in Belfast. I brought him to that tent revival. He went into the little room and he, he made a profession of salvation. He even... Uh, on the same service that I went forward to go to Bible school, he came forward too. There was four of us guys who went forward. He was the last one out. He was going to go as well. And so I thought he was going great. You know, me and him uh, were friends. And, and uh, one day we were coming home from Belfast. We're in the, in the bus, in the back of the bus. And we bought, bought some things. And, you know, I'm sitting there. He pulls out a cigarette. And he, he lights up a cigarette. You could have just knocked me over. I got out of my... I stood up. I says, what are you doing? I said, you're a Christian. I didn't even smoke. I, I didn't even smoke before I became a Christian. But he says, what are you doing? Christians are not supposed to smoke. And by the way, Christians are not supposed to smoke. Or chew. Mm -hmm. Or run about with the girls that do. Right. right? <laughs> and we know that. You know, 60 years ago, they say smoke for your health sake and all. It was all, you know, but we know better today that all that kind of stuff is hurting your body. All right. I says, what are you doing? And before long, he was out of church. And even after I went to America uh, to go to Bible school, it went, got worse and worse and worse. I came back on uh, a summertime. I got to see him. I brought him to church. And I remember it was at the Peace Wall in Belfast where our church was. And I remember going out. I was talking to some people and I looked out the window. And there he was. He was walking down the street. And I said to the guy who was standing next to me, I said, you know, this, this man is making a decision tonight. That will, change, that will change his destiny forever. It will, in other words, he's, he's making decisions 
that will affect the rest of his life. And I believe it happened. Because after, that was the last time I ever seen him in, in that church. And he got a girl in trouble. And then he, uh, he got in trouble with paramilitaries. Um, and he just, uh, he got married. He got divorced. And he, he's probably lost count of the women that he's been with. I mean, constant, 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 constant. And I look at his life, and I have to say, and I love him, and I want him to be in heaven, but I don't think he's going. No. I really don't. Something didn't happen in that little room, in that tent meeting. He may have said the prayer. He may have made a profession. Basically, here's what I'm saying. Hey, you say you're a Christian. Prove it. Uh -huh. Prove it. Because there should be proof. Now we're not saying that a Christian can't backslide. We're not saying a Christian can't sin and sin seriously. We're not saying that a Christian cannot be uh, defeated by sin. I think true believers can have all those things happen to them. But when the direction of your life is sin, 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 sin. There's no conviction. There's no chastening. There's no consequences. You're lawless. You're doing your own thing. There's no evidence. Now here's the thing that's difficult for us. I can't see in his heart. And you can't see in my heart. We can't see into our hearts. I think of another person that I know and love. And I believe the man was saved. I believe he's in heaven. But he wasn't perfect. But when I look at his life, there's things that I see that are indicators that God was in his life. When he sinned, there was, there was problems and there was sorrow because of that sin. And, and uh, I could see where God was working in his life. There was evidence, there was fruit in his life that he really, truly was born again. I want you to look at one last script, and I know I'm over time, but this is important. Look at Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty-two, and we preached on this a few months ago. So, can a Christian live in sin? And I think the answer is no. If you now, you got to, you got to qualify. You know, what does it mean to live in sin? That it's constant rebellion, godlessness, even though they profess the profession. Now see, for us it's difficult because I, I'm, I'm preaching the Bible tonight, but you're thinking of people. Is he saved? Was she really saved? And I'm doing the same thing. And, the, and it's a problem because ultimately only God can really give you the answer to that. We'll probably get to heaven. There'll be some people there who didn't think we're, we'd get there, wouldn't be there. And we'll probably get to heaven also and we're going to miss people that should have been there. We thought we'd be there. I mean, that's that's reality of it. But it doesn't, it doesn't negate the fact that John is trying to tell us you've got to be able to... These Gnostics, they are not of God. They're not born of God. They're not saved. And you, you, don't let them seduce you. Don't let them deceive you. Because there was also a temptation for the Christians to, to get in on some of that. Now, it would have been a disaster for them. The true Christians would have been convicted left, right, and center, and God would have chastened them. And it would have been a disaster, a disaster and a misery for them. But the temptation would have been still there. And so he says, don't get near them. He's trying to identify them. He's trying to beware, beware. These are wolves in, in, in sheep's clothing. In chapter 2, verse 22, and we won't get into all this, but he says, it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now he's just got talking about apostates, people who identified as believers, and then they walked away. And what he's basically saying here is, this was inevitable. And it is true. People identify with the truth. They identify with salvation. Identify, they profess Christ. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. And they're back to what they were at before. And he says, the dogs returned to his vomit. The sow that was washed back there wallowing in the mire. And I made this point when I talked about it before. That when you take a lost person, and you bring him to church, and he starts attending church, he doesn't get saved, but it reforms his life. He's listening to Christian teaching. He's like the pig that gets washed. And he has avoided many of, the common, uh, many of the problems that sin brings into his life. But then something happens because his nature is not changed on the inside. And the natural thing for a pig to do is to get into the pigsty, the swill, the, the mud. Pigs love mud, right? Sheep, sheep don't love mud. When you get saved, you go from being a pig to a sheep. You're, the Christian's never described as a pig. A Christian is always described as a sheep. It has a, it has a different nature. The nature of the pig, it can be wise. You can talk him powder, put a bow on his neck, but let him go, and sooner or later, he's going to be in the mud again. A sheep 
might fall into the mud, and, but the sheep is not going to be happy in the mud. It's going to be bleeding. Get me out of this. I don't like this mud. Because sheep don't like mud. Christians are sheep. And a Christian might fall into sin, but you're not going to stay there. Right. And if you are there for a long period of time, you're not happy because you don't like mud. And God is chastening you and God is making your life a misery and he will do that. And some Christians will even die if God can't turn you around. He doesn't stop working on you. That new man is still there tapping on your shoulder. The Holy Spirit is still there because the Spirit vies against the flesh. It lusted against the flesh. And when you're going after the flesh, the Holy Spirit's jealous of you. He's coming after you. He's not going to let you alone. He's coming after you. And if you're walking in the Spirit, then the old flesh is jealous. It wants control of your life. It's coming after you. But see, a true Christian has that battle going on. I'm simply saying this in our closing. Thank you for being so patient tonight. I want you to think about this. When Peter sent, see, here's what I'm saying. Lost people don't react to sin the way true Christians do. It's different. And so a true Christian can't live in sin in the sense that he constantly is there and he's happy with it. When, when Peter sinned, and he said sinned very, very severely, they were taking Christ to crucify him. He's warming himself at the fire and the wee girl says, uh, you're one of those Galileans, your accent gives you away. He said, no, no, I don't know the man. Three times he denies Christ. When he denied the third time and the cock crew and he looked up and he saw Jesus being led out. And Jesus just looked over at him. And Peter's eyes met Jesus' eyes. What was the reaction? What happened when Peter sinned? Yeah. He went out and he wept bitterly. A lost person wouldn't have done it. What about David and uh, Brother uh, Jeremy preached on David a few weeks ago. David sinned, oh my goodness, how bad does it get? To commit adultery with a man's wife and then take the man out and get him killed. Do you think that God was dealing with David's heart even before Nathan got to him? It was a year before Nathan got to him. Read Psalm 51. He says, you're breaking my bones. My bed is covered in tears. David mourned even before um, uh, he was set straight. But read Psalm 51. And he says, Have mercy on me, O God. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And he was broken about his sin. And he was repentant about his sin. That's how a Christian reacts to his sin. A lost person, he'd want to do it again. What about Paul? Did Paul ever sin? He said he was the chiefest of sinners. But read Romans chapter 7. He said this. O wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he says I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But my friend when, when Paul sinned. And he did. I, I can't imagine him sinning. But he, he did because that sin nature is still there. But how did he react to it? O wretched man that I am. Friend, when you sin as a Christian, it wounds you, it hurts you, and you cannot live with it. Something's got to happen. Your life would be hell on earth, living in sin. It really would be. No fellowship with God. The guilt. You have no testimony. It's all gone. Maybe even death would be the ultimate result of a true Christian living in sin. No, a true Christian can't live in sin the way a lost person would. No way. And somebody who's truly been born again cannot sin, 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 sin without in his heart, his heart bursting. Because God will not let you go. And he might even take you home if you don't turn. Because once you're in this thing, you can't get out of it. Because something has already happened in your heart. You've been born of God. The Spirit of God is there. And so that's my interpretation and my application of a difficult passage. Now, if you don't agree with me, and you're very welcome not to agree with me, but you have to go through the same process, and you have to come up with an interpretation that is correct and not contradicting other scriptures and something that makes sense. 
And if you've got a better interpretation and a better application, then tell me about it, okay? Because my ears are all open. But I think that helps us to understand what John was talking about, about the historical, grammatical interpretation of Scripture. And you can use those tools with other hard passages as well. Let's all stand together. I have went on way too long tonight. And I keep telling myself I'm not going to do that, Brother Joe. But... So we're just going to pray and we're going to be dismissed. And thank you so much for your attention tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you that salvation is by grace. Lord, we do not deserve it and we could not earn it. We could not attain it except that the righteousness of God has been given to us as a gift. The righteousness of Christ imparted to us when we believe upon him. And we thank you, Lord, that you changed our life forever. And Lord, we're sorry for the people that are indulging in sin and wasting their lives. And there's no, no inkling at all that God is dealing with their hearts. We have to say that by all indications, that person is not saved. And then there are Christians, Lord, who have fallen or they're in sin or uh, they're defeated. But Lord, we know that that Christian is not like a lost person. Their heart is breaking. They're overcome by guilt and maybe feel trapped and defeated. And Lord, we know that you're speaking to them and we should try to help them as well. But Lord, it's, we, we thank you that even for the Christian, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as Jesus taught us, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. And those of us who have been saved, who, uh, Lord, when we fail and when we sin against you, we get our feet dirty, but we thank you for cleansing daily. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us. Lord, maybe there's somebody here who knows they're not saved. Help them to realize the danger in which they stand tonight. And help them to come to you. Lord, we thank you for every Christian. And Lord, for Christians here who maybe have failed sometime recently, maybe they're discouraged, maybe they feel guilty. Thank you, Lord, that you're the friend of sinners. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that you came to cleanse us. And Lord, that the cleansing is open for us. And Lord, as you're standing in the light, we can walk out of the dark and into the light and receive communion and fellowship with you and forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, that we belong to you. Lord, we wouldn't have it any other way. And help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Help us, Lord, to cooperate and to love the Holy Spirit and to be filled with you, Lord, and that you may guide and direct our lives and keep us in the light. Lord, bless your people tonight. Thank you for their patience. And Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing tonight. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Good. <clears throat>